Okay. Yes. So um, let me introduce the speaker. Today we have Josh Gansher, who's a postdoc at CMU, talking about our compositional verification of security protocols. So. Great. Yeah, hi, I'm Josh. I'm a postdoc with Brian here. Uh, so what I work on broadly is like programming languages and formal methods for basically making cryptography more secure in a lot of different facets. Uh, today I'll be talking about I work on OWL, which is about how to verify security protocols in particular. So by security protocols, what I mean are things like TLS, is modern version quick, uh, WireGuard, or more generally protocols in this noise framework, which as we know are basically critical to our everyday digital lives and basically forms the foundation of how we do things online, like how we establish identification, how we interact with banking, e-commerce, and like storing all of our private information on the cloud. However, because of, in part due to their general purpose use, these protocols are generally massive. So the defining RFC, for example, for TLS is over 130 pages of English text. And that's only one RFC of many RFCs for TLS. While one of the most popular implementations of TLS runs into hundreds and thousands of lines of code, over 500,000, uh, sorry, 570,000 lines of code for the underlying crypto, this is like symmetric ciphers, elliptic curves, things like this, and over 67,000 lines of code for the protocol logic of TLS itself, the part that actually does the TLS. And because TLS in particular is so widespread and complicated, over the years, there's been a number of attacks on TLS, such as uh, these here, I won't read them, but they all have like catchy, you know, single word names, where people trick TLS, or more specifically often open SSL, uh, or sometimes the core protocol of TLS itself across different implementations to completely violate the supposed security of these protocols. And what's interesting is that a lot of these attacks, including all of the ones here, are that they're all attacks on the high level protocol logic of TLS itself or the implementation and not the underlying crypto. Nobody's breaking the security of like AES here. Instead, they're tricking the protocol into doing something secure, which means that even if you ensure that you know all the underlying crypto is perfect, the crypto is only as good as how you use it. Uh, are they due to bad implementation of the protocol or the logic itself? Uh, but okay. There are instances where the, I'll talk about this in a second. Okay. This is where the protocol logic itself is faulty, and there's instances where the logic implemented is not what's specified by the RFC. So this talk is all about how to use crypto well. And the method that I advocate for is to use formal verification, mathematically sound tools that prove that your implement implementation of TLS is running correctly and doing cryptographically secure things. Now, formal verification for this domain is actually a pretty old topic. Uh, so let's see what exists out there. So indeed, there's a ton of work on applying formal verification to the underlying crypto mechanisms, like Fiat Crypto, or Tackle Star, Jasmine, Saw, and Veil, and a bunch of other ones. And these tools have seen a huge amount of actual good industry adoption, so which is incredible. So, for example, uh, yeah, Crypto has produced code that has ended up in Boeing SSL and by proxy Chrome, while Hackle Star has code that ended up in Firefox and the Linux kernel. While these are great, we have to remember, though, that these verification efforts on their own do not protect against misusing the crypto. You could have the most perfect elliptic curve implementation possible. But it doesn't matter if the protocol is insecure. So what's on the other side for verifying protocol logic? So there's lots of tools here too, but unfortunately, they've only been used so far to basically analyze mathematical abstractions of the protocol logic and thus align a lot of details that show up in implementations. This means in turn that the protocol that you analyze with these tools, such as the so-called abstract version of TLS, is not at all going to be the same as the version of TLS that's running inside of OpenSSL or boring SSL. And because formal verification is all about the little details, this unfortunately means that the protocol logic that's running in these implementations are still broadly unverified. And because of these gap, this gap, these tools don't really have much of an adoption in practice, as it's really a, difficult to apply them to realistic pieces of software. Just to expand on this last point, I'll give you an example. So TLS, because it's so important, has been actually proven secure many times. Some efforts on paper, a big effort in a verifier called Tamarin, and another one in a huge 
uh, complicated verify with called crypto verify. And this is great. TLS is secure, so we can all go home. Until the attack in 2019, after all of these groups came out, which showed an attack on the protocol logic that is actually an attack on TLS itself. Uh, it turns out there's a feature in TLS called external pre shared key, that you don't have to worry about too much, uh, that completely breaks the security when it's run in a way that is actually allowed by the RFC. So, what happened? Why is this attack work and why do these groups work? None of these groups over here actually managed to uh, encode this external PSK mode that Selfie was attacking. Um, because of this, you know, this gap between the attack and the proof, I argue that we don't only need to verify protocols in the abstract, we need to verify the protocol logic as implemented in these actual real world implementations. And if we don't do so, we're always going to miss critical security development details and open ourselves up to new theoretical attacks. Questions? So the external PSK is that uh, implementation details or is uh, on the lo logic level? It's on the logic level. It's something that's allowed by the RFC for TLS. So every good implementation would do external PSK just as the RFC says it can do it. Turns out it's actually an insecure thing to do because the RFC is under specifying how you can use this external PSK. And this is not captured by the then right hand side those proof papers. Exactly, because these proof papers consider a model of TLS where they did not actually consider this external PSK feature. That's right. So this is my goal essentially is to verify protocol logics as they're implemented. So why can't we do that yet? So why is this so hard? Why can't we just shove all of OpenSSL into Tamarind? The underlying issue, I believe, is about scalability via compositionality. Again, take TLS. So TLS is a huge protocol, especially when you implement it in the real world. It doesn't even make sense really to verify all of OpenSSL in some big tough swoop. You'd have to break it up into modules. So on the protocol logic side, what this means is that you want to break the protocol into smaller, hopefully separable chunks, proof security for each chunk, and then somehow combine these security results together. So for example, TLS can be thought of having at least three components. The handshake for establishing keys, key derivation for turning old keys into new keys, and data transfer over the record layer once you have the keys. So ideally, you can break security into these three chunks and then combine them together to have a security result about the protocol itself. Unfortunately, these protocol verifier tools that I've described before have little or sometimes no support for doing these compositional proofs, which means you basically have to shove the entire protocol into one file and verify the protocol all at once. And so my point here is compositionality or breaking your protocol into well-defined chunks is crucial not only for scalability, verifying bigger protocols, but also if you want to reuse proofs of, across different protocols, Perhaps you modify TLS for post quantum resistance or update the proof in the presence of new constraints uh, on the protocol. You want to be able to do compositional proofs. So, to support compositionality and to support kind of realistic protocol, uh, verifying realistic protocol logic, um, our vision is to enable a new paradigm for end to end verification. So, using our tool, which we call OWL, Developers can, developers can encode the protocol specification and receive low level efficient implementations of protocols that are guaranteed to be secure, imp implemented correctly, and are interoperable, both with unverified versions of the same protocol, so they can talk about along the network, and also interoperable with other pieces of user code that want to plug into these verified protocols. And opposed to all the other verifiers I talked about before, which are kind of special purpose tools about analyzing a single thing. We envision OWL to be more of like a development framework that ties everything together and eliminates any source of gap between the specification and the verification and the implementation that might harm security. Uh, so I'll be talking about OWL today. So what does OWL look like? In more detail, the framework so far looks like this. The user inputs a protocol written in the OWL language. And then what we do, which is uh, new for our domain, is we have a type checker that makes sure that the protocol type checks. The guarantee we get from the type checker is that if the protocol is well typed, then the protocol is secure. And once we know that the protocol is secure, what we do is we feed the output of this type checking pass, 
which includes exotype information into our verified extracted pipeline using another tool called Verus uh, to obtain uh, verified implementations. What we obtain is Rust code that's verified to be memory safe, meaning among other things, there's no buffer overflows, functionally correct, which means that it's doing the right thing corresponding to what uh, the OWL source code says it should do, and slide can will be the meaning that the uh, security leakages in the extracted code match the um, security assumptions that come from the L protocol. You don't leak any more like timing information or something like that. So today, mostly I'll be talking about this first, the first half of this, uh, which is the type checker. And the type checker is coming from our uh, Oakland paper this year uh, with me, Brian, and Gritak and some other students. Uh, so that's what I'll be talking about for most of today. So when we have, uh, so for this proof assistant called OWL, there's broadly speaking three components that will make, that we argue are is important for having a scalable proof assistant. Computational security, modularity, which I've already talked about before, the yeah, compositionality, that's just another word for modularity, and proof automation, which means that the user does not have to, you know, manually uh, do a lot of proof effort to get the protocol to be secure. Um, so, the thing is, there's a lot of tools that have these goals. So, for example, EasyCrypt uh, is both computationally secure and is a modular proof assistant. DYSTAR is a uh, proof assistant that has modularity guarantees and also has automation, but is not computationally secure. And CryptoVerif is a tool that has computational security and some automation, but is not at all modular. So, the question, of course, is how do we get something that's the best of all three worlds? Because what we argue is that all three of these are very important for um, scalable proofs. So first, let me just go over computational security. So as we're in a crypto audience, I think this part uh, should ring true to you. So uh, basically, I want to contrast computational security, which you all are very familiar with, with symbolic security. So basically, symbolic security is a formal method technique where you model a crypto using kind of abstract term algebras that uh, have no probabilistic behaviors whatsoever. And when you do it this way, you specify the adversary not by what it's hard to compute, but what, but, but by what the adversary can compute. So for example, you have rules that says, if the adversary knows K, and if the adversary knows an encryption of M under K, then the adversary knows the message M itself. Um, on the other hand, in the computational world, the crypto is not given by these abstract terms, but it's given by bit strings and probabilistic programs, which like Turing machines, which you're more familiar with. Uh, and when you do it this way, you don't specify the adversary by what it can compute. You say that the adversary is any arbitrary polynomial kind probabilistic algorithm. And then when you do it this way, you don't specify the, the cryptography as what the adversary is allowed to derive. You specify the adversary by what it's hard, uh, by what's hard to derive. So for example, over here, you don't say that you can, you're allowed to do a decryption, you say that it's hard to deduce the difference between two different ciphertexts if the key is secret. So in summary, the idea here is symbolic security has a very subtle connection to cryptographic assumptions. The trade-off here is it's a little bit easier to do using over here, but the computational world has a very direct connection to underlying cryptographic assumptions and is ultimately what we want. So because it's ultimately what we want, OWL is mostly is all about doing computational security. Any questions here? Okay. Uh, so to get a little bit more into what the protocols look like, here's just a little basic idea of what the model for these protocols. So all of these security protocols basically have the same format. Um, there's a bunch of parties that are over a network. You assume that the attacker controls the entire network. So if Alice wants to send a message to Bob, you can't do so directly. You have to give the message to the adversary and then hope that the adversary delivers it to Bob on her behalf, of course. You don't trust the adversary, so the adversary is allowed to read the message, modify it, you know, do deep packet inspection, all you know, the most pessimistic network uh, possible. So how the how these protocols work is first you assume for the protocol to work at all, you do some kind of notion of ground truth. How that works is you have a notion of pre-shared keys. That's kind of the setup for the protocol. So for example, let's say you have a PKI, you have a public key infrastructure. So how that would work is you assume that you generate some signing keys and some verification keys, and you give the top person the signing key and you get everyone else the verification key. 
this PKI setup, of course, is um, is special to each protocol, has a different notion of setup. And then when you run the protocol, essentially what you do is the attacker is allowed to query a bunch of parties. When it queries a party, whether it gives it an input message, the party processes the input message, you know, does some computations, and then eventually gives an output message back to the adversary. And then at the end, the attacker, the adversary is going to um, you know, do this a bunch of times and eventually end the protocol. And when you do so, you basically have, broadly speaking, three different security goals about this execution. You have secrecy goals, which means, like, for example, the key remains secret to the attacker. The attacker knows nothing about the key in a computational sense. You have integrity goals. For example, uh, the, the website that I was served is actually the website that I expected to get. And authentication goals. For example, if I'm talking to you, uh, then you must believe that you're also talking to me. Uh, so to give an example of one of these protocols, uh, consider this little protocol here, uh, where you're just, the goal of the protocol is the client has a secret value X that wants to send to the server. However, the client is not going to do this directly, but they're going to do this little protocol. You assume that the server and the client have this pre-shared key, PSK. What's going to happen is the server is going to not send key. Uh, what, the, what it's going to do is the server is going to generate a data key, K data, and encrypt the data key under the pre-shared key and give the ciphertext to the client. In return, the client will decrypt the ciphertext, obtain the data key, K data, encrypt X under this data key, and then send that type of text back to the server. And because the server has the data key, because it uh, generated it, it can obtain the value of X. Any questions about this protocol? Um, so what do we want to prove about this protocol? Broadly, we want to prove um, these security goals. There's many others you could imagine that we'll just like, for example, give these, these two right here. So unless somebody is corrupt, you want to have an integrity goal, which means that the server actually gets the right value of X at the end of this protocol, and there's a secrecy goal, which basically means that all three of these uh, values remain secret. The attacker can't derive PSK, the attacker has no information about X, and so on. So, okay, so how do we prove a protocol like this secure? What we do in crypto is something called game hopping, also called the hybrid technique. Basically what you do is you don't prove um, security of this protocol directly, but instead you reduce the security of this protocol to another protocol using a cryptographic assumption. And then you do this many times until the final protocol is, uh, you can deduce that that is secure easily. So what we do is we first see that the pre-shared key is being used, but not being encrypted, but nothing encrypts the pre-shared key. So because of this, we're actually allowed to idealize the pre-shared key. This uses standard assumptions for uh, encryption, for example, cybertext integrity and semantic security for the encryption scheme. And what this does essentially is idealize the first message and turn it into, instead of encrypting the data key, you encrypt a bunch of zeros instead. And the reason that this is sound uh, is due to these two cryptic objects in the middle here. And essentially what this, you know, there's a more fancy way of talking about this idealization. Essentially what you do is you zero out all of these encryptions so this is like coming from semantic security. And the second thing is you replace all of the decryptions under the feature key with this ideal log. And this is coming from cybertext integrity. But the point essentially is that the attacker cannot tell apart the first protocol from the second one. Because if it could, it would be violating the cryptographic assumption. And essentially what you then can show is that the second protocol is secure only if Sorry, the first protocol is secure only if the second protocol is. So instead of analyzing this protocol, I'm now going to analyze that protocol. And then you can keep going, keep doing idealizations until you eventually reach this kind of final protocol where essentially the messages on the network look completely random, completely independent of any of the actual secrets. So we think of this as kind of like a fully idealized protocol because you can have done as many idealization steps as you can. And then at the end, what you can do is basically what a cryptographer would say is like an obvious, what you basically prove key sequence and integrity properties via basically program analysis, which essentially just means it's a fancy way of saying that you look at the protocol and you can kind of deduce that it's secure without doing any more crypto reasons. So this is great. 
Um, and this is what happens in a lot of crypto uh, computationally sound crypto verifiers, such as EasyCrypt and CryptoVerif. So what's the limitation here? So as I mentioned before, the limitation is all about compositionality or modularity. So what happens though, is that game popping, this technique I just showed, is actually a non-modular technique. So suppose you have two protocols that are, or, sorry, two sub-protocols that are working with each other, P and Q. For example, P could be Alice's half of the protocol, Q could be Bob's half of the protocol. So P and Q can actually share secret keys between them. They could talk to each other. It's just two parts of the same protocol. And let's also say that P idealizes to P prime. Let's say that there's a game hopping step that you know can say because P only uses the key in this way, it has some nice properties. It's not going to be the case that if P idealizes the P prime, that the whole protocol will also idealize. This is actually pretty easy to see because uh, if Q is using the key insecurely, then of course the whole protocol cannot idealize, even if P uses the key securely. And this non-modularity is essentially what prevents you from doing a, modu a modular proof of bigger protocols. Even though TLS has this um, nice computational structure, you cannot by just by game hopping alone without a lot of extra effort, uh, turn security results of the sub protocols into a security result of the whole protocol. Uh, said another way, game hopping fundamentally requires whole program techniques. You have to analyze the whole program, the whole protocol, such as to idealize, an, to idealize an encryption key, every use of the key has to be correct. And because of this, you cannot do separate verification of different parties. This is really uh, really dissatisfying because you know when you're writing normal code, you don't ver you don't type check or you don't verify, I should say, every function all at once. You want to look at part, make sure that this part is good, make sure that that part is good, and put them together. So we're looking for a better way. So our uh, uh, approach or our suggestion here is to use a type system. So how can a type system help do this? So basically, here's the workflow. First. We're going to devise a type system such that if P is well typed, this turn style thing means well typed, where sigma here, I'll explain in a minute, is like the context of the type system. If P is well typed, then every game popping step that you desire already exists. You prove this about the type system. And what you prove is that if P is well typed, then P is secure. Once you have this result, you then can then recover modularity because type checking itself is modular. What this means is that if P is well typed and Q is well typed, then P alongside Q is also well typed. So we're circumventing the non-modularity of game hopping by basically doing the game hopping steps at the end after you've done all of the composition. So what does this look like in practice? Basically, you have this set of what I call cryptographic invariants, sigma. Basically, this is encoding the structure of the protocol into the crypto keys. For example, you might have an invariant that says K only encrypts even numbers. If I believe this invariant and then I decrypt something under K, I should probably believe that my plain text is going to be an even number. Similarly, you can say things like the signing key SK signs Alice's public TV home key. Or for example, you can say hashing G to the XY, the city helmet secret, results in the session's encryption key that later has some nice property. So the first thing you do in OWL is you specify these cryptographic invariants in this thing sigma. Sigma essentially represents the common beliefs that all parties have to share to actually participate in the protocol. Next, what you do is you build this well-typed protocol step by step. You know, you write down Alice main, you write down Bob main, you let the automatic type checking process, which I'll talk about in a second, um, type check Alice main, type check Bob main, and then for free, you're gonna get that Alice main alongside, alongside Bob main is secure. And basically what you're doing here is you have the cryptographic invariance and then type checking proves that each party respects the cryptographic invariance that you specified in the first step. So for the TRS specifically, what does the Sigma environment involve? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, th that would in, that would uh, basically involve 
programming TLS in that Ruby system, which we haven't done. But like broadly speaking, first you have the setup keys. For example, there, there's a pre-shared key in TLS or there's a certificate authority. The certificate authority is like a signing key. So you have to specify what kinds of things do the certificate authority sign. And then later on, you know, you have these um, like Diffie Hellman keys, right? You have the static Diffie Hellman key of the server, you have the ephemeral Diffie Hellman key of the client. And then this sigma here is going to say what kind of key do you get when you hash G to the X Y with all the other, you know, the assumption information in it. Um, so it's basically you encode all of the invariants of the protocol um maintains and assumes long execution. I'm going to give an example. Like something that, that's in the different half of the code that's not in the code that's attached. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. You you write the invariants first, and then you write the actual code of the protocol. Okay. Like, well, what I'm a little bit confused about is how is this invariant related to information flow? Like the, the, this invariant is not capturing information flow properly. Um, in a sense, it is, but um, the information flow is mostly about how um, the information flow properties mostly come from the fact that the protocol respects the invariance. Um, I can say more offline, but basically the idea is that um, is that the invariants are kind of specified before you talk about the information flow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when you define a type system, how do you know that you have captured all the invariants because uh, uh, like, is there a way to know like exhaustive like for something like TLS because it's very uh, it's a huge problem. Yeah. So the the thing the thing is, you don't write TLS first and then write the invariants and make sure that those match up. You write the invariants and then you write TLS and then you if TLS type checks under the invariants you've given it, then it's exhaustive. So it, it's more about like, um, you don't write the invariants to capture TLS. You write to your left to respect the invariance that you wrote the first time. The first time. And also at the beginning, you said that you want to like avoid side channel attacks. Mm -hmm. How do you like even model those? Because side channel attacks are really hard to model. Yeah, I mean, so this is mostly talking about like the security of like kind of the functional specification, the security of the abstract protocol. Well, I can talk about side channels later. It's more about the verified extraction. Uh, but the high level point here is with the type system, uh, the type checking, which is really important, is completely automatic. You know, there's type checkers for Rust code, there's type checkers for, you know, Daphne or other kinds of like fancy type theory thingies. This is one of those. So you write down the protocol and then the, the type checker just automatically type checks the protocol and then that guarantees security kind of by fiat. In fact, what you do is you get for free that if the protocol is well typed, then the protocol is secure, which means that there must exist one of these sequence of gate sets that goes from P to P prime all the way to PI, where PI is where you can't idealize anymore. And then you prove that, P, that then you prove on paper that if PI is of the form where you cannot idealize it anymore, then it's secure by the type system. And this is an ordinary information flow result that I can talk about later. So another way of saying this is you once and for all prove that for all sigma and all p, if it's well typed, then it's secure. So this is an on paper one time proof effort. And then you can reuse it by type checking many protocols using the same proof effort. Uh, let me just say a little bit about the type system, how it actually works, unless there's any questions about the general setup. How the type system works, I'm going to go by this relatively quickly. Uh, essentially, um, so the sigma parameter is actually was formally called a name context, and the type system basically revolves around these name contexts. So a name essentially is uh, the technical term we're using for a cryptographic key. So each name specifies uh, basically two things, an abstract handle to some randomness, for example, K actually means like, you could think of it as like a region of the random tape um, in like a Turing machine random tape kind of thing. Um, and separately, there's some invariants that we talked about, but how the handle is allowed to be used. So the example here is one of these name contexts. So here you say that N is a nonce, 
um, nonces are basically used for like opaque random data. So they, they can be used for basically anything, but they have no guarantees about like how they can be used. Um, and then below that, you have K is an encryption key of tau, where tau here is like a data type in a type system that I'll, uh, I'll explain to you what the types are in a second. And the idea here is tau could actually contain this value n, which means, for example, that K could, if that K could encrypt n. And then, for example, you can also K prime is another encryption key that encrypts another type. So one of these types, these tau's, the data types in a language, um, they're what you expect to see out of kind of a ordinary looking type system with a few like added you know twists. The first is this name of n type, which I'll talk about in a second. And the second thing is this refinement type, excess type tau, but also fee holds, which allows you to specify basically arbitrary integrity properties. Um, what was interesting is unlike you know ordinary lambda calculus looking type theory things, um, in our system, types actually denote concrete bit streams. So we're doing very concrete crypto using this kind of this type theory. So um, there actually is a kind of a invariance about what it means for a protocol to be well typed. Essentially, it means that all of the names remain secret. For example, if E has type tau and phi holds, then you get that if K was secret before E ran, then K is secret after E ran, essentially. Um, and you also get that phi is this type refinement, and basically you get that phi holds with high probability. So for example, if phi says that E outputs the value of X, then you get that after phi runs, it must actually be the value of X with high probability. By high, you mean overwhelming? Yes. Okay. Yeah, like all the negligible. Okay. Great. So let me just give you an example of protocol. This is the same one as I showed you before. Let's just show you. I'll just talk about how you actually encoded an owl. So first we have these localities. Localities are essentially uh, the parties, so the server, the client. And then you have these name declarations. This is what your sigma looks like. So for example, you have X is a NOS. Every name is specified with a locality annotation. This locality annotation is basically what the, what the setup is before the protocol. So this says that uh, the nonce is stored at the client because the client has the nonce is trying to send it to the server. And then you have kdata. kdata encrypts this type called name of x, which essentially is a single type, which means it's a type that contains exactly x. So what this invariant says is that kdata only encrypts the value of x and nothing else, which means that when I encrypt under kdata, I can only encrypt the value of x. And when I decrypt using kdata, I get that it must be x there. Uh, and the PSK is the same thing as kdata, it's encrypting kdata instead of um, instead of x. And the point here is that now you can actually write the code of a protocol. So here's the client. It's written in a pretty, like if you know, see like OCaml, uh, ML, one of these kind of languages, it kind of looks like one of those. Um, so what it does, for example, is what the client does is it inputs I on the network. That's like the ciphertext. Um, ignore the second line for now. It then does a decryption under the PSK using I. If it decrypts correctly, that's in the sum case. You then encrypt. Um, you then encrypt under that K that you obtained the value of X and then output on the network. And if the decryption fails, you just do nothing. Um, the second line that I told you to skip before is this core K thing, which is a little tiny proof attitude thing that basically does a case split on whether or not PSK is corrupt, which I'll talk about. In, uh, I'll explain what that means in a second. But the idea here is essentially that this is a piece of code that can type check an owl and it type checks completely automatically and completely independently of the server. So this incremental type checking is really the main feature of owl. Um, so the soundness of our technique and what this court case thing is about essentially crucially relies on a hierarchy between the names, which protects the secrecy of data and avoids key cycles. So this is essentially where the information flow comes in. So we do so through this very simple information flow type system uh, where the labels are drawn from this grammar here on the top right. So L has type bracket N, N here is a name. So for each name, you actually have a label for that name. And then you have the end of two labels, that's like the information flow and the joining of two different dependencies, things like that. 
You have an adversary label. That's the label of the uh, static adversary. We only consider static adversaries in this work. And then there's a bottom label for basically static data that doesn't depend on anything. And the point about uh, these names is that these labels form a hierarchy. You actually get that the name of the label X on the bottom here flows to K data, which flows to PFK. What this gives you is that because the adversary is a label in the system, we get for free that if PFK is corrupt, then anything below it also is. So if the adversary is corrupt at PSK, we assume it's also corrupted key data and it's corrupted X. This is really important because it rules out basically certain like uh, key compromise attacks. For example, if you've decrypted PSK, if you've corrupted PSK, then K data basically should be only leaks to the adversary because the adversary can just decrypt the ciphertext. And what's cool about our system is that we don't handle hierarchies only like simple linear things like this, but we actually hierarchies handle hierarchies that look more like this, where the pre shared key encrypts not one data key, but many data keys, each of which encrypts its own data. Uh, we have a way of encoding how this works, but I'm going to skip this part just for time. Um, but the point about OWL is that OWL sub supports the modularity not only within protocols like client and server together, but also modularities across, across protocols using type-based abstractions. So for example, suppose you have a protocol that first does a handshake to establish keys like K data, and then performs a data transfer data transfer stage using that data key, like how we transport X. So because these are logically two different phases, it would be better to actually prove them separately. And indeed, you can do this with OWL by having the data transport and the handshake protocols live in different modules. Crucially, our type system allows the data transfer module to type check only using the specification of the handshake module, but not the underlying implementation. It only type checks using the types that are present in the handshake, but not the handshake itself. This is great because what it allows you to do is instantiate the handshake in any way you want, as long as it matches the specification. For example, you're allowed to do the handshake with public keys, or you could do it with pre-shared symmetric keys. So this is essentially what our OWL tool does. It's a new language of a type checker, and it allows separate verification across different parties, subroutines, and modules. Um, if you're interested, we support a bunch of different mechanisms, essentially all of the ones that you'd want in TLS, like authenticated encryption, hash functions, collision resistant hash functions, digital signatures, all that kind of stuff. And we've done a bunch of case studies with it using our concrete verification tool, which is written in Haskell. Um, we have all these little case studies. Uh, the biggest one is like a toy version of Cardros, essentially. Um, what we're working on ongoing work is to do drop-in replacements using our verified extraction pipeline that I'll talk about for a few minutes um, for dropping in new interoperable, like fully featured versions of Kerberos and Wirecard using the L, the L framework. So how do we do this uh, drop-in replacement? I'm just going to wrap up by talking a little bit about ongoing work on our, on our extraction pipeline. And this is where our side channel decisions will come. So how do we actually do this uh, verified extraction? We're going to leverage earlier work on verifying Rust in our group with Veris. Uh, Veris is a new program verifier for verifying Rust code that takes very um, clever advantage of the Rust type system to do, uh, to do verification. And essentially how, how it will work for us is well, after we type check, we do Veris extraction, which actually produces two different objects. There's a functional specification this is what the code is supposed to do. And we have an executable Rust implementation, which is what the code actually will do. And the functional specification is almost basically directly equal to the input L code. All you do for the functional specification essentially is just erase all of the proof annotations that don't matter for actually executing it, like this core case thing. And then down here on the executable Rust implementation, this is where you have all of the gory low level details that are more about running it correctly and securely and less about the high level protocol logic. So this is things like having zero copy ciphers, uh, verified parsers, efficient state machines, uh, all of this kind of you know uh, low level programming junk that people often want to write in like handwritten assembly, this kind of stuff. Um, 
So how do we do our proof? What's interesting is we don't do the proof once and for all. Um, we don't prove that everything out by the various extraction pipeline is correct. What we do, which actually works very well for us from our current experiments, is we don't extract only those things. We actually extract another thing, which is an auto-generated proof script that relates the functional specification to the executable bus implementation. So we both extract functional proof specification, implementation, and also a proof that the two things are uh, are related. And what this proof gives you is essentially the things that you want. Memory safety, functional equivalence, these are kind of already given. And then ongoing work, which I can talk about offline, is about how this proof will also give you side channel resistance. We have some uh, work in this direction that is still very much an open problem for how to do it in Veris. And the dream uh, that we're kind of going up to is to link this executable Rust implementation with user-defined Rust code. If we can get to the stream and all the proof steps work out, then what this means is that any uh, piece of code that uses WireGuard could just as well use the Allo version of WireGuard. Like the Linux kernel could just link with the Allo version instead of the uh, handwritten C one. And that's kind of our, our end dream here. So to wrap up, this is Al, the confidential uh, verification tool for security protocols using information flow. Uh, the advantage here is that it's modular, it's automated, and it's computationally secure, just like you want from a crypto group. It uses novel type system techniques for constructing the secure protocols. So you prove security once and for all via a type checker. And, oh, sorry, the protocols are typed via the type checker. You prove the security once and for all about the type system. We have a wide variety of case studies with ongoing effort into doing WireGuard and Kerberos and doing interop and all this kind of stuff. If you're interested, um, the you know the development is here and here's an email address. If you have ask any questions, I'm more than happy to chat offline or if there's any collaboration opportunities, that would be great too. Thank you. Can you comment on the efficiency of the extracted code versus, like, let's say, uh, uh, today's implementation? Yeah, that's a great point. It's uh, that's also like ongoing effort. I think that um, that we will be able to do something pretty efficient. So, like, a lot of the efficiency guarantees do come from low-level handwritten assembly stuff, but all of that kind of stuff is often inside of the um, cryptographic. Uh, routines, for example, like elliptic curve cryptography, all of that stuff, uh, we plan on taking advantage of verified imp implementations that already exist. For example, the heckle star stuff. Um, on the protocol logic side, there's not a lot of like handwritten assembly inside of the protocol logic, but you still need to not do, you know, silly things like have like, you know, cloning objects everywhere and having a bunch of memory leakages. And because of that, we're expecting to actually get pretty good performance here because we can use the Rust type system to um, essentially make sure that we're not doing any of these kind of, we can like safely do, for example, like zero copy ciphers, which means that you don't like have a new buffer for the ciphertext. So does your type system guarantee like the running time of the code? Like for instance, if there's like this infinite loop and the code runs in exponential time, like the computational properties may break. Right? Yeah, that's also a good question. Um, so currently we assume that the code runs in polynomial time. We do this by the code not having loops in it. Instead, what the code does is it runs over a number of sessions. And, he's, and the, ses the number of sessions is polynomially redundant. Um, we can chat with all Oh, we have, we can encode loops, but they encode loops via, we basically have to assume that the loops run in polynomial time. Uh, but yeah, that's, I mean, obviously a great uh, point. But there is one thing about this that is important, which is that the way we prove security, uh, well, the way that other people prove security often assumes that the running time is independent of the length of the keys. Um, or at least the number of loops is independent of the number of keys. And if you have this property, then it's easier to prove security. We don't do so here, but you can imagine that it is also good. You, you, you don't keep track of the number of loops. We just assume it's polynomially bounded and yeah, we use the type system to ensure that's polynomial bounded right now. Because the type system to me usually just assume it's polynomial. Um, the type system is just track of the running time of the code. 
there I can, I can explain more offline. Okay. Yeah. It's like the, the, the structure of the language ensures this, I would say. Any other questions? So I guess no more questions. Uh, let's thank Josh again for doing this.